Have you ever wondered what the size of an airborne dust is? On the average, the size of most airborne dust particles range from 0.5 microns to 100 microns. Hello, my name is Talha Akhezi. I'm a first year PhD student at NC State University, and today I will tell you about a new electronic device called the Neural Dust, which is of the size of a dust particle proposed by the University of California, Berkeley. Neural Dust is a wireless ultrasonic low power solution for chronic brain to machine interfaces. Throughout this presentation, I will tell you what that means. In this presentation, I will start by telling you about the state of art in brain to machine interfaces. Then I will dive deeper into how neural dust works. I will start by telling you about the concept of neural dust. Then I will tell you an extension based on the recording of the neural dust particles. And then I will finish off by telling you about the recent results. And then I will conclude the presentation. This presentation is based on the only three papers released by the original authors in Swarm Lab, California, Berkeley. These three papers describe the neural dust concept, an extension to recording, and then recent results based on a prototype that they have um, made. Brain to machine interfaces are used for neural recording neural activity in the brain. This process is performed by listening for what are called action potentials generated in neurons which travel through axons. Extracellular recording is the most commonly used technique for in vivo recording and stimulation because of its relative simplicity when inserting electrodes into the tissue. In this slide, you can see the basic idea of current extracellular recording techniques. The positive side of the recording electrode, as can be seen, is placed very near the axon. The negative side is uh, placed farther away so that, you can't, so that you don't record the same thing or the same action potential in both electrodes. And the final reading of the action potential is measured between these two electrodes. On this slide, you can see the popular electrodes used for extracellular recording. Current state of the art include micropipettes, as can be seen here, sharp electrodes, microwire arrays, or microwires used single, used as a single microwire, Utah electrode arrays, and Michigan electrode arrays. The main difference between these two electrode arrays is that the Michigan electrode array has multiple recording sides, sites on its um, single needles. To record neural activity, all of these electrodes need to be inserted inside into the brain. Let's now learn about the neural dust system as proposed in the original 2013 article. This figure shows how the neural dust system is placed and the purpose of each device. On the outside, we have an external transceiver, which has the long range transmitter transcranial communication, an application-specific integrated circuit, the memory, data processing, it includes the data processing, um, the battery, and the battery. Inside this call, we have a subdural sub transceiver, which is also called the interrogator, since it talks forward and back um, with the neural dust, and it, it receives information from the neural dust and um, talks to the external transceiver. It includes an ultrasound transceiver to neural dust, transcranial transceiver for external communication, and it's encapsulated with polymer. Inside the brain or the corte cortex, we have the neural dust particles. It's, they are encapsulated with polymer. They've got recording sites, the two sites that we talked about for extracellular recording, uh, a CMOS front end, and device electronics. And in the center, we've got the heart of it, which is the piezoelectric material. Now let's zoom into a single neural dust or a moat and examine how it works. Neural dust is again this 10 to 100 micron electronic device, which is used for extracellular recording wirelessly. The most important piece of this electronic device is the piezoelectric material since it's the heart of it. When an ultrasound hits the neural dust, it starts resonating um, the two plates of the neural dust and the piezoelectric material in between, when it vibrates, it generates a potential which could be used inside the uh, drive electronics and the CMOS front, front end. The authors have um, simplified the circuit which is seen on the left, which, will, which would have been used for extracellular recording, to the one on the right, which includes just a simple um, transistor um, which is used to verify the electronic impedance <clears throat> changing the reflected wave. Um, 
the vibration gives enough voltage for the circuit. And in the, ne in the next slide, we will see how this data is transmitted back with the information of action potentials. In this slide, we can see the subdural transceiver or the interrogator, which talks with the neural dust. Again, what makes this system possible is this piezoelectric material um, inside the neural dust. So when the interrogator sends a carrier message to the neural dust, the neural dust vibrates. And with that vibration, we have enough potential to record extracellular um, voltage. With this recording, we send another signal, which is called the backscatter, to the interrogator. And then from the interrogator, we get the signal um, or the information, which is either there's an action potential or there's no action potential in, uh, near the neural dust. Now let me back up a bit and then show you a problem with the neural dust and how the authors propose to solve this problem. So as you can see on the left, we have the neural dust um, and you can see the two recording sites. And in the beginning, we had said that the distance between these, these recording sites are really important since we don't want them to uh, record the same, uh, same thing. So what the authors have proposed is a polymer tail which takes one of these recording sites away from um, the other one so that we record uh, the potential um, between the um, one near the axon and um, another one farther away, which um, is the ground electrode. Even though this concept is realistic, how do we record from thousands of neural dust modes? This question is answered in an extension by Bernard et al. from the same group. He uses beamforming, which is used to suppress interference by making use of spatial properties of multiple sensors, just like how it is used in modern communication systems with multiple antennas to reduce interference, beamforming is utilized for neural dust. Although there are some simplifications done to the work, like taking the neural dust to be scattered on a 1D line, and exact measurements between interrogators and um, neural dust, as seen in this figure, it is shown that high resolution linearly high resolution linearly constrained minimum variance beamforming sufficiently suppresses interference from unselected neural dust modes. Next, I will tell you about some of the recent results of the real system from the most recent journal article. Here you can see the final, final prototype. Uh, on the left, you can see the assembly prototype. Um, and on the right, you can see the real system um, with a piezoelectric material of the size of 250 microns in length. Notice that even this prototype system is really, really small, and it's five millimeters in total length. The authors have used this prototype to verify simulation results of power delivery through ultrasound and backscattering waves, corresponding, uh, whether they corresponded to inputs or and the simulation results. On the top, you can see the experimental setup of power delivery. We have um, basically a pulse generator amplified and sent in as an ultrasound. And um, on the receiving side, uh, we have another amplifier and an oscilloscope checking to see if the um, power received follows the simulation results. On the bottom, you can see the experimental setup of the backscatter wave testing. Basically, we have a pulse generation, pulse generator, an amplifier sending uh, the signal in as an ultrasound wave. It hits the neural dust or the prototype of the neural dust. But now we have another DC, a DC supply, um, which emulates a, an action potential. And then we try to read from the backscatter um, this, this data of the action potential. Now let's look at some of the results. On this, <clears throat> on this slide, you can see plots which represent uh, the simulation, which is uh, shown in A and B as blue, and the data collected points, data collection points uh, using experimental setups uh, shown in uh, red plus marks. The first plot verifies the transfer energy simulations. Um, so as mode sizes um, get smaller, uh, they follow the transfer, uh, transfer efficiency simulations. Um, the second plot, plot B, um, is the plot of the impedance spectroscopy. 
And the last plot is just the frequency response of harvested power on the piezoelectric material, which reinforces the re reliability of the simulation. On this slide, you can see the plots, which uh, shows the backscatter sensitivity as the mode size gets smaller, or the piezoelectric material size gets smaller. Again, the blue plot is uh, from the simulation, um, and we have different simulations in this case. Uh, on green uh, for green uh, lines, uh, green dashed, uh, black, black dashed, and the measurements rep are shown with the plus marks, plus red, red plus mark marks. As you can see, the sensitivity follows the simulation, even if the size decreases down to 100 microns. Although the authors have tested many aspects of this work, many challenges remain, like building smaller neural dust particles, exposing two small electrodes, building that polymer tail and finally injecting these neural dusts into the cortex or the brain. In conclusion, I've told you about the state of art in brain-to-machine interfaces, and I have told you about the neural dust, which is the project um, about the wireless ultrasound low-power solution for chronic brain-to-machine interfaces. Through telling you about this, um, I went into the concept, uh, went into explaining the concept, told you about a recording extension, and then I finished with some of the recent results that the authors have published.